Last time, the ghouls hustled to get Chris Jacobs' 392 Hemi installed in his 1968 GTX in time for SEMA. And the epic Hellcat Crate Hemi was diverted from John Buck's 1971 Challenger to our 1970 Tribute Superbird. With pressure mounting and SEMA just around the corner, we take a breath to look at some never-before-seen Mopars currently in queue for restoration that were left on the cutting room floor. Including an ultra-rare, surviving, one of 48, Hemi Kuda Hardtop in B5 Blue. From this point forward, christened as our Phoenix Kuda. Unbelievable. They're coming to get you, Barbara. I'm Mark Warman, and together we bring dead muscle cars back to life, to exactly the way they were on the day they were born. This is our uh, last episode of the season and uh, I wanted to talk about where we're at in the shop right now, as well as share some of the stuff that you didn't get an opportunity to see this season because it just doesn't fit into a one hour episode of Graveyard Cars. I wanna start first with what's going on in the shop and our deadlines, that type of thing. So our Superbird, we now have a good direction on our Superbird tribute car. It was going to be a 446 barrel four speed. We opted because of the short timeline to get to SEMA to put the Hell Crate 707 horsepower engine with the Mopar controller. So with that plan in place, we are working quickly to make sure that we get that car put together and that we can drive it when we're actually down at SEMA. I do believe it's gonna be a very well-fated car and I think it's gonna be one of the more talked about cars of the SEMA show. Uh, my buddy Chris Jacobs is 68 GTX. That's a neat little project. Again, we're not doing a restoration on it but we are fixing the tragic fire that happened. Uh, we're getting and have installed the 392 Hemi in that car. It's good that we have the conversions. Ron was able to come up from Magnum, help us do the conversions and get that engine installed. So from here, just like our Superbird, time is very short to get this car ready to go. Our beautiful 1970 Dodge Challenger 444 speed. Plum crazy white stripe black top, one of 916. It was finished this season, thank God and delivered to its new owner. I've heard from the owner since he got the car back and he's absolutely thrilled with it. I love the car, I am sad to see it go, but I'm really happy that the owner is in love with the car and thinks we did a great job. One of the cutest couples that we've ever had on Graveyard Cars, and we've had great ones. I mean, the cooks were wonderful. We've had some really neat, neat families out here, but the Zinks were just adorable. Just, they're just perfect for each other. You could tell that there's a match made in heaven. <laughs> Look at this Look at this. What a cute couple. <laughs> Every car we give out, has that emotional attachment to it. But when it comes to like the folks that had the Roadrunner, to be able to see them go out and to see them drive it and to look at the old pictures of them in it going off on their honeymoon, I mean, it just, it's very fulfilling for me. Our General Lee, now that was a, that was a really interesting car. The car had uh, suffered blunt force trauma. Remember, it held the record for the longest and the highest jump in any General Lee history. That's in the television show or in the movie in 2005. This was an official freeway launch car. Now, because this car has suffered so much damage and because it wasn't a numbers matching Hemi car or a 446 pack or something like that, we didn't have to worry about how much or how little metal we replaced. We didn't have to be conscious of that. So we started at the back of that car and worked our way forward. At the end of the day though, what a blast. We took that car out, I had so much fun with it. I still get emails about how funny you know, my bit was as I was doing Roscoe P. Coltrane with Flash. I believe that that car was one of the biggest transformations we did in GYC history. How about my new best buddy, John Buck? He absolutely loves it here at Graveyard Cars. I think if he could retire, he'd probably come up here and just sweep floors. He loves it here. He's a car guy. His little 71 Challenger formal roof car, it just turned out beautiful. And I've said this many times too on Graveyard Cars. When a car starts out good, solid, complete, maybe even a driver like that one could have been, 
they show that much better in the end. John, when he got that car, was so happy, so thrilled. He's like a little kid. He went out, he had a blast in it, even though Alyssa likes to get my blood pressure up. Overall, he was thrilled. So thrilled that he came back and asked me to build him another one just like it, except with a Hellcat engine. Now, as we know, unfortunately, we aren't gonna be able to make it to SEMA with that car with a Hellcat, but that doesn't mean it's not being built. It's back there right now being built out. It just won't make it to the SEMA show this year. We would love to take it next year. So one of the things I wanted to do uh, here is talk about some of the really cool cars that we are working on that are part of Graveyard Cars that aren't necessarily stuff that make it into the show. And that's just a time thing. It's absolutely nothing to do with the priority of the car or the client. So one of the cars that we're working on now is a 1970 CUDA 440 six barrel, four speed shaker hood EF8 green that the guy's dad bought many years ago. So Alyssa's spoken with him, his name's Marty. Uh, they were out here and they talked about the car and what it meant to him. I'm Marty and we heard about graveyard cars from a buddy of mine that I used to work with. I knew Mark was a guy to try to get a hold of when it came to doing these cars. So one other really cool thing uh, about Marty was he traded in three cars to get this uh, 70 Cuda restored. Uh, one of them was a, a 70 Barracuda Grand Coupe convertible. That's B5 blue and white top. Uh, the other one was a 70 Barracuda, uh, originally a 318 three-speed car. It's red with black top and interior. Early production, 1970 Cuda, 446 pack, four-speed, 410 Dana, shaker hood. Dad's had it for, I don't know, since 74, early 74. And it's still less than 30,000 original miles. I grew up in that car. And it's not very often that you get an opportunity to have three cars traded in on one restoration, because I can do a lot with those. Those will be part of my graveyard motors. Uh, I inherited these from my father. He had, uh, at one time, five 1970 Cudas of various models. So and he had four left when he passed away. He had an old, I want to say it was like a 57 or 58 Plymouth that he kind of got started with in his younger days. And then when he moved to the big city, you know, back then it was street racing. And uh, he had that, bought that 69 Roadrunner, brand new, and uh, did a little street rating with it. But uh, then when he wiped it out, he decided that he got lucky and survived. So no more street racing. He started taking it to the track. And at the time, Omaha had a local quarter mile drag strip. And I used to go to the drag races with him. And that's where I got into it. This is definitely a tribute to my dad and passing on his legacy. Real nice dad car. bought a beautiful car. Don't know why you don't show more on the show. Numbers up the crap shack. Numbers engine, numbers transmission, numbers carburetors, everything is right on this car. Now, in 1970, they built how many 440 six barrel four speed Kudas? See, I knew you were gonna ask me this. 902. Fruit of my loin. Stay tuned. We continue to take a look at some of the Mopars currently in queue for restoration that were left on the cutting room floor, including a mysterious surviving one of 48 Hemi Cuda hardtop in B5 blue, our Phoenix Cuda. Back in the early mid 80s when that car got redone, uh, my dad put it in some local shows. Shirley was almost done with her drag racing back then. She was a Mopar lady. Her name was Shirley Cha-Cha Muldowney. She was just a pure, die-hard, love-to-go-fast pioneer. She's the first lady of drag racing. She kind of broke into the sport for the females. His dad absolutely loved her. He just thought she was the coolest thing in the world. And he had an opportunity to meet her. And that, to him, was one of the highlights of his life. So tell us about uh, this blanket. As far as I know, it was just an army green blanket. Since his car didn't have a console in it, it was a place that uh, he could put that in as like an armrest for him. But for us, as young kids, we could sit on it and put one leg on both sides of that transmission hump and you can still see out the windshield without anybody sitting in the back. And if you were sitting on that uh, blanket, 
you'd have to hold on because otherwise you'd, you'd end up in the back seat. So he used to come and pick us up at the farm and take us up to the city and spend time with him. A lot of good times. You still have that blanket. Oh yeah, and I still have the blanket. That's why I said it's going in this car when it's done. You can do Chevy and Ford anywhere in the country. Everybody knows if you know Mopar, there's not as many of them around, let alone shops that'll specialize in them or turn out the quality of work that uh, this place does. Since I was wanting to do a tribute, you know, for my dad, that's why I made the contact. We've kind of managed to get it all under one roof. So we are doing a good job on the cars, doing a great job. Cars are right, they're as close to accurate as we can make them with today's parts and availability. And at the same time, I genuinely care about the car and its history. So when you put all those together, I do think that Graveyard Cars can and has and will become a destination for many cars in the future to get their second chance at life. It'll be uh, nice weather only. It will not be a daily driver because I want to make sure it stays in great shape to get passed on. It will not leave the family. Since it had such little rust repair that needed to be done and it had beautiful fenders and doors and all that, is have George drop what he was doing, get the pieces made for it, get them welded in so that he can get it out to the mudroom. So last week Mark came to me at the end of my shift on Monday and said so we have this rush car that's got to get in, got to get it done. So by Tuesday morning I pulled this car in and we started work. We cut out the inner fender and replaced it because right around the battery tray was pretty darn rusty. And then I had to cut out a patch panel in the floor and I'm putting the brand new one in and trying to keep the rest of the floor pretty much intact. It's not that rusty. So a big job turned into a fast job. This is one of the fastest cars we've done in the shop. I'm looking at four days right now as I stand and I will be done today. So this is our Q5 GTX. This car came to us a couple of years ago. It's a Q5 Seafoam Turquoise 69 GTX. Absolutely, yeah, beautiful amazingly car. beautiful car. Got the cut and buff completely done on it. Got the whole car washed. At that point, I bring it back in the booth, flip it up on its side, uh, mask off the rockers, the engine compartment, and the back area. Not every car here is an undercoating car. If it was coated for undercoating or a sound deadening, then we do that. If the owner doesn't have a preference, we undercoat it. But sometimes they're not coated for it, and they're the kind of car like our 1970 Dodge Coronet 426 Semi four speed oh, yeah. car. Beautiful car. Yeah, or, or our green RTSE, yeah. where they want it painted and simulated like a factory look. And so in the case of our GTX, it was an undercoat car. Bring the undercoating in, and we undercoat the whole thing, nice, clean, sanitary. It'll sit in here for a couple of days, unmask it, put it over to Dave, and then we'll put it on a bin pack, and he can start assembling it. Value Guard hooked you up with a nice pump with the 30 gallon drum. Yep. And, uh, and Will, I say you, but I mean the shop. Yeah, yep. Will does all the undercoating out in the booth area. I'm working on this beautiful 69 GTX. Seafoam turquoise, you gotta love that color. The paint's amazing. Unfortunately, this car kinda got dropped on me. Uh, normally, Will would you know, completely assemble the car, hood, deck lid, everything on the car before it arrives to me, but the body shop guys were screaming for the whirly jig, so of course, it gets dumped in the shop. Uh, working on multiple cars at the same time, uh, uh, it can be stressful, and as long as you can stay on top of it, keep things organized, uh, it goes pretty good. So it's just the art of getting a flow going mm -hmm. on the car, yeah. you know, and getting into a rhythm, and then you can uh, get a lot accomplished. So I'm gonna try to knock out and get as much work done as I can on this car, and actually I'm gonna go ahead and start placing my parts order. So I'm just inventorying right now, get put on what I can get put on, and uh, hopefully it'll run through the assembly room pretty fast. Well, what I got right here now is I got our 3 8 fuel line in right here, as you can see. This being a 440, has a quarter inch return line, so that's what I'm doing right now. So I'm straightening it out. Inline tube's amazing. They put these stickers on there so it says straight, and so when it's bent up in the box, you know exactly the area that you gotta straighten out. So you're not just bending this hose, you know, and ruining it in a sense. It's already pre-bent. It's all set up to follow the contours of the frame rail and the body of the car. So I just kind of get it pretty close. And the nice thing is I can kind of manipulate it a little bit whenever it's up in the car. So I'm gonna start back here, and this one will actually piggyback my 3 8 fuel line. Just baby over 
over here. I'm gonna run it down while I'm watching this end. So bam, there it goes, right in there. And this here is just gonna be on your 440s and larger engines. So your 440, your 446 barrels, your 426 Hemis will all have this big 3 8 fuel line along with that quarter inch vapor return line. And I'll tell you, sometimes these things are a booger to get on there. Anything we can get done on these cars, I know these fuel lines aren't gonna be in the way of what Will needs to do. And then it's gonna help me stay ahead of the game. So whenever he needs to borrow the car to get his stuff done, I already got some of my stuff done. So it's all about working together here at the shop, man. And when the pressure's on, we got a whole yard full of cars. We wanna get these things done, so. All right, ghouls, we have a good one for you this week. So put your thinking caps on. The 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner was the first model year to receive which of these items? Disc brakes, bucket seats, rally instrument cluster. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll give it to you. All right, ghouls. So which of the items first came available on the 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner model? If you answered rally instrument cluster, you are correct. Alpha code A62. 1968, 1969, it was not available. Couldn't get a rally instrument cluster. You get their standard instrument cluster and you could order an N85 tachometer for it, but it was not a rally instrument cluster. The disc brakes in the bucket seats, they were available as an option from the day the Roadrunner was made in 1968. My name is Brian Landsberg. I'm from Wadsworth, Illinois. I own a 1970 Dodge Challenger RTSE 440 Magnum, and I also own this 1970 Dodge Challenger convertible. Back in April of 83, I bought my 70 RTSE. It's a 440 Magnum automatic air conditioning loaded with power toys. One that's in here that hasn't gotten a lot of screen time is one that Tony D'Agostino and I a couple seasons ago went out and talked about because it was a good solid car. It's what would have been a very undesirable green back in the day, F5, is actually a beautiful green today. It's beautiful though, I mean just uh, it's always nice having a formal roof car, you know, overhead console at the leather power windows. I mean it's got everything. It's probably a one of one car, you know yeah. they made 733, how many of them were optioned like that? How many of them were those colors? Exactly. Probably isn't a twin to it anywhere. So in 2003, when my son was going to college, I sold the RTSE. The car needed some restoration again because I had had the car restored in the mid and late 80s. So I put the investment in my son. I sold it to a guy that was a trucker. He sold the car within a year of buying it to another guy that I had interested in it at the same time. He bought the car and went from Wisconsin to Tennessee. And then somehow his wife became ill and then he had to sell the car. So I went to a, a collector car dealer. That collector car dealer took it to an auction and sold it to another collector car dealer in Roanoke, Virginia. Then my friend, who I've been lifelong friends with for 40 years, called me up one day and said, there's a Challenger on eBay, you should check it out. So I checked out the eBay link to this Challenger. It was not mine, but just out of curiosity, I started clicking on the rest of the Challengers, and lo and behold, there was my green RTSC. I was surprised because that was not the car that my friend had told me about. So just had he not told me that day to go on eBay and, and nose around, I probably would have never found my car. It was a good driver quality car, a 26,000 mile car, and all the time that I owned the car, I always wanted that kind of quality of restoration that only Mark's been able to provide. The owner wants to try to preserve as much of the original interior as he can. And the main reason for that is there are replica reproductions out there of almost everything, not the headliner. And those replicas are close, but if you have a good, clean, original one, that's the one you stay with. It's a lifelong dream for me, at least since I was 16, to see that car perfect. In the late 90s, mid 90s, I bought this convertible behind me. And it was an old man that lived in the same town I lived in in Wadsworth, Illinois. So after I purchased the car and had it for a while, same situation, nobody around did Mopar restorations. And this one was in need of much more work than the, the other car that I had. I decided to go ahead and cut that car loose. Once I made the connection with Mark to redo my 70 RTSE, I started thinking about this car, wondering if I could reacquire it. So I ended up finding out from the friend I sold it to, who he sold it to, and the car had been sitting in this guy's backyard since 1999. When he sold it to him, it was great shape. When yeah. he got it back, it had been outside, sitting in the mud and the sleet, yeah. and his heart was broke. 
all the way down to the rockers and mud with a tarp on it. And I got a flatbed, made a deal, went the car out, shipped it to Mark, and that's the start of this journey. Were you pretty surprised to see the condition of the car after you sold it? I was in tears nearly over it because it was a running, driving, really a pretty nice car that you could restore at the time. That poor Challenger, if you lift that car up with the forklift in the middle, the whole car bows on both sides of it. Not everything that when it shows up here is possible. Not everything. I mean, it is possible, but what's the dollar amount? Going to be a challenge. Challenger. Yeah. But that's what we do. That's going to be a, yeah, real. Graveyard cars, miracle workers. Yeah, the 70 RTSE is in pre-paint stage now. Will is a tremendous artist with it when it comes to paint work. He's not just a body and dent man, he's an artist. And Dave's fit and finish every screw and every window adjustment, every door adjustment and every panel it would be like an owner doing it themselves, that kind of love and care. Again, we have just every kind of Mopar imaginable here. You've been doing the Dodge Challengers. You've done quite a few of them lately. Yeah, lots of e-bodies. <laughs> yeah, between yeah. Gar 70, 446 back, four speed endurance car, all that stuff. Have you gotten a better rhythm down, would you say, on a Challenger as far as what you need to order, what process to put it together, how to get it out the door, maybe more so than the 68 Charger, which we haven't even done one yet. Yeah, of course, yeah, the e-bodies are, like you said, there's so many more parts available for it, but we've done so many in that shop that I can almost do them blindfolded. The you only don't thing need that, the car there. Exactly, the only thing that's gonna throw me for a loop on this one is the power windows. Yeah. Anytime you have power you know, components, it always uh, kind of messes <laughs> with your mind because you're used to putting standard roll-up windows in and standard door panels and stuff like that, so. Do you remember that sunroof car we did back in season two? The oh, yeah. Yeah. One. Yep. That thing was a stripper. There was nothing. There was nothing but a fender tag and a shell there. I mean, in the dash van, that was it. So we had to get hold of Tony back at Tony's Parts and say, I am desperate for a wiring harness. And it is amazing how much wiring harness works those power windows and how it intersects with a lot of stuff up underneath the dash. It's not just a hot wire going to those things. It's a lot of stuff, but having a good parts vendor helps. Yeah, I remember that episode when you worked on the 70 Challenger sunroof car all the trouble you had getting that sunroof to work. Uh, I'm hoping I don't have to do one. <laughs> Here's but, my uh, advice. Turn in your notice when you see one come in with, <laughs> just do it, just yeah. save yourself the misery. That is the most miserable, nothing available, no information available. Now I've got all the, I've made photocopies of TSBs and things like that that I have, but I still, if I had to jump into one right now, I'd, I absolutely wish I hadn't. You know where I ended up getting the cables from? Uh, Nobody makes them. American Sunroof Company's been out forever. There's a guy in Australia making them out of billet aluminum. The little ends in the cables. Both of the cars are gonna come home, go in my garage, gonna be show cars. Obviously the 70 RTSE, the one I've owned for the longest. Now I have my adult son, he's newly getting married, he's gonna end up with children. I have an extended family of my own, and I already have grandchildren. They're all gonna be a part of this process, and when I actually found this convertible back here, I had my oldest granddaughter on the hood of it as we were wenching it out of the dirt at the guy's house. So it'll be nice to see her with the end product and a picture of her back on the hood of that as well. The green one was a piece of cake. That's a good, solid, clean, original car. But that purple one, we'll have our hands full on that. We just, I figure I'm gonna take the radiator cap up, have you hold it, yep. drive another convertible underneath it, <laughs> put his original radiator cap back down, done. There you go. Well, I think for sure the green one will probably go to my son. He was part of that process of selling it for college and reacquiring it after college. And since he was born, he's known about that car and I'm certainly gonna make sure that it ends up in his hands. Coming up, we conclude our showcase of Mopars currently in the queue for restoration. And we finally reveal the dramatic and gut-wrenching story behind our Phoenix Cuda. An extremely rare, one of 48, Hemi Cuda hardtop in B5 blue. Unbelievable. In other words, the CUDA model was born in 1969. Is that bad? Uh, With all new panels being put in these cars, you should never have to hit anything that hard. <laughs> that say it, 1970 CUDA would. Didn't you just tell them to be yeah. quiet? Um, and that hitting the hammer is the fastest that got to the egg. Those other are 
toilet. Toilet's <laughs> Evolutionary U-turn. Yep, set man back a couple thousand years with one <laughs> guy. Yeah, Darwin didn't count on his ass, did he? <laughs> Dar Darwin <laughs> up. Okay, hang on here. You know me, I like to present things. Show me the money! <laughs> Jerry Maguire. Show me the money! <laughs> the f is that? Really? Merry Christmas! Did it? No! <laughs> you ever crap in your hand and throw it at somebody? I had a friend that used to do the in his hand and throw it at people. Hit him in the back. Oh my god. Well, he was in jail. And he was taking a deuce ski. What they call an open duke, an open dump in prison because there's no walls around yet. And some guy's making fun of him because of his face because he's constipated. And so he just reached down and pinched one into his hand and the guy took off running because he knew what was going to happen. <laughs> and he nailed it right between the shoulder blades of the dupe patty. Oh my god. Yeah. That's just so respect good. Respect the open dump, man. That's true. Respect <laughs> the open dump. Oh, man, that's all. Doug, you ever have to take an open dump? So far, we've showcased some incredible new Mopars currently in the queue for restoration and their owner's personal stories. Soon, we'll finally unveil our ultra rare one of 48 Hemi Cuda hardtop in B5 blue and its gut-wrenching backstory. Unbelievable. Uh, another really cool car that we're working on right now, again, it has been disassembled, uh, has been inventoried. Good, solid car. 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner for Scott. Now, Scott ah, is the gentleman. His last name is Draper. Friend. Scott had the beautiful 2008 Challenger SRT8 in Hemi Thank Orange. You, Scott. Beautiful orange. That was a great car. Yeah. Fast. The one you stole at gunpoint. Borrowed. With your accessory, William Will. Scott. Yeah. That's why I see two in one. That's why I see peas in a pod. I saw the footage. Yeah, Will betrayed me. I don't know why we're not two peas in a pod. He's, he's dissension. Because he was out there at the fence and he said he'd cover for you. No, he didn't. He's only that? told me. He told on me. No. Okay, if he told you to jump off a building, would you do that? Probably not, right? Okay, that's my point. Right. Trouble, trouble, trouble. She stole the car, had no miles on it, had nothing on it, zero mile car. She took it out and just blasted it around town. I didn't know anything about it. She told me she was going pee. Now, who am I going <laughs> My name is Scott Draper, and I'm out here today at Mark's shop talking about my best friend in high school, 69 Roadrunner. He unfortunately passed away uh, four years ago, and this was his car since high school, and a vision of his was someday to get it restored to the degree that he wanted it to be, and he was a perfectionist. That's why I sought out this shop to make his dream come true. Yes, this car was an original 383 four-speed car. I'm, I can't recall exactly how long that motor lasted, Steve did a lot of street racing back in the day. He, his vision was to make it a 440 uh, six-pack A12 car, uh, tribute car, and pretty much had it assembled to that degree. It was a running car when I brought it out here, but it needed a lot of just perfectionism. When I was looking for a place to entrust the car with, I reached out to Mark and kind of gave him my story. He said, we'd love to take the car on. I understand it's a long process and uh, there's a lot of things that have to be done. As you can see right now, it's in the disassembly stage and uh, excited to be out here today from Iowa to, to check on it and, and uh, talk to Mark about the scheduling of it uh, moving forward. I mentioned Mark that I had a 2008 Dodge Challenger SRT8 limited edition. Bought it new. It had uh, 694 miles on it. Uh, Baby the car, climate controlled, loved the vehicle, but had had 694 miles on it before um, a criminal, a career criminal, Alyssa Rose. Did you see the episode where she stole the car at gunpoint? I did. I did. I'm seriously so excited. We have people that just want to go to speed limit. So, so just out of curiosity, to have a car that's almost 10 years old and only have 694 miles on it, that means you pretty much babied that little thing, right? I just did. cherished it and took care of it? I did. I have to admit, I never even did a burnout with it. 
always thought about doing one. Yeah, but, but uh, you wouldn't want to put the extra mileage in the wear and tear on it. Enter the thieving child who decided to take it out without my permission, run the hell out of it, bring it back with over 11 more miles on it than when you traded it in for the restoration itself. Some bugs on the windshield. Bugs on the windshield. Oh, <laughs> You know good and well I told you not to drive that car. I specifically told you not to drive that car yesterday. Well, we just went around the block, Dad. No, we're gonna take that up later. She lost her privileges for a year, by the way. All right, folks, we got a true or false for you. The 1971 Dodge Charger was the very first model year that concealed headlamps was available as an option. Think about it. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll see. All right, folks, how'd you do? True or false? 1971 was the first year the concealed headlamps were available as an option on the Dodge Charger. This is a tricky one. Got to think about the wording. The answer is true. Now, before you start throwing stuff at the TV, the concealed headlamp L37 Alpha Code was available on the 66 Charger in its inception, 67, 68, 69, and 70. Standard, it became an option in 1971. It went away at the end of the 1972 model year. So, gotta listen to the kid when he's giving you these. The ice tray knows what he's talking about. You guys leave the part about me being an ice tray in there. Yeah, there he is right there. Awesome. Just keep coming back. One of the cars that is here now is without a doubt, by all meanings of the definition, a survivor. 1971 Hemi Cuda, hardtop. Now you guys that watch the auctions know even the hardtop versions, in some cases, can be a seven-figure car. This is a numbers matching, they're all shakers, keep that in mind, so of course it's a shaker. Numbers matching automatic car. They made a total of 48, that's it, 48, 1971 Hemi Cuda hardtops and this is one of them that is here to be restored. And you'll wonder, if it's a survivor, why are we restoring it? Well, you need to wait and see that. So what I got, one of 48 ever made, rarest car, one of the rarest cars on the planet and most desirable, come in here for a little freshen up. 74 Duster? 1971 nice. Plymouth Hemi Kudu. When was the last time you saw one of those? No, it's not a convertible. Yeah. It's a hard top, automatic, one of 48. B5 Blue. Uh, original more. Hemi car. Okay, stop right there. You have never seen a car like this at Graveyard Cars. You'll probably never see another one like it. And when it goes down in the history books, not to build it up too much or to be too hypey, you're gonna see that the story and the car are second to none. You will not wanna miss a second of the restoration of this car. Good to see you, sir. I'm Wendell. I'm really glad yeah, to be here. Yeah, nice to meet you. We I'm really excited phone. about this. I've waited a long time for the, to get this car really properly done. It's time to freshen it up, I'd say. I think so, yeah. This is Dave Ray, number one nice technician, Will's nice second best painter in the world. All right, right there. very yeah. cool. Yeah. Hey, good. good, I'm gonna critique. Y'all, please yeah. do. <laughs> Guess you're not painting. I've painted B5 Blue before, have you? No. And whoop day it is like the rap song. Uh, yeah, it'll, need, it'll have to be perfect. Absolutely perfect. With a little orange peel in it, like it comes from the factory. Right. Oh, you want the you want the original look. You don't yeah. want the super slick, shiny. Hey, this is a really rare car. It, it needs- Are you really gonna do that? It needs to be original That's like cool. it. It needs to be original like so it came down the, right off the line. I'm gonna have to call Jennifer at PDG and ask exactly how, what we want to lay that out. I'll just let you paint it. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want the nice orange peel look, yeah, Mark yeah. will take care of that. So yeah. this is great. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, Are you ready? Show us your baby. I'm excited. This is awesome. This is it. This is it. 71 Hemi Cuda hardtop. 48 of them, man. What's up, dog? This is the moment. You ready? Let's do it. 1971. Unbelievable. 
Okay. This is the moment. You ready? ready? Let's do it. 1971. Wow. What is this, Wendell? <laughs> there was a little fire. 71 here, good. <laughs> yeah, there was a. What do you call a spark? That does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. That's not going to buff out. <laughs> that is not going to buff. I don't care what Joe Dirt wants to do. I confess the word survivor was a bit of a play. I call that car a survivor, not because that's where it's original paint or original interior or any of those things. It's a survivor because the owner had the wherewithal to get in and out of that garage. You're going to have to oh work a little Oh my God, bit. look at that thing. You're Holy cow. You're going to have to work cow. a little bit harder on this one. My name is Wendell Mulberg. I was involved in a structure explosion and fire in 1999, and my 71 Hemi Cuda was in the fire, and it was destroyed. And I wrapped it up, and I kept it protected for the last 18 years. I contacted Graveyard Cars and Mark, and they're gonna restore my car back to its original condition. It isn't that it's one of 48 or a 426 Hemi. It's that the gentleman, Wendell, who's a sweetheart of a guy, he contributes his survival to the survival of that car. When he reached out and he sent me the photos and I heard in his voice what it meant, then it means the same thing to me because I think that's what a good shop owner does. It's rough, I sat for a long time and you guys can make it like new again. I think it's just different when you see it in person because of all the ashes and everything yeah. is left on it. But I'm, I'll tell you why I had the most faith in all of this. Anything that survives like this deserves to. And the fact that an aluminum dash bin that with a match you can melt right. for whatever reason, be it from above, was saved on this car and it not damaged. There. Numbers matching, B5 blue. It's, what color yeah. is the interior? I forgot. It's black, leather front seats. <sighs> One day, May it was about May 20th, 1999, and a buddy of mine and I went and met at my shop after dinner about seven o'clock and we went in there and one of the cars had leaked gas all day long. And the dripping gas had vaporized and there was only a small puddle on the floor but the air was filled with gas. And I walked in and started opening doors and windows probably as most people would do to air out the gas fumes. And there was a spark and the spark caused an explosion. It blew all the doors and windows off the building. It blew the garage door across the street through the neighbor's fence. The friend that was with me got blown out into the street and had third degree burns. When I heard the flash of the fire, <laughs> I, um, I dove on the ground and the building exploded. There were paint cans. The paint cans were exploding in the air, and it was just a big ball of fire. And I was lucky; I was on the floor, face down, and I crawled out of the I crawled out the door that had blown off the building. But in the aftermath, I I was watched everything burn up. Fire department said that I'm actually one of very few people that survive an explosion. I was fortunate to get out of the structure, but dealing with it afterwards has been a very difficult thing. It took a while to get over the, uh, the distress of what happened. And actually, I let it set for years. I didn't even look at it. And when I get the car back and it's finished, that will put the end to all of this that I've been through. And losing the car and the structure explosion and all the trauma that went with it, it's gone. It's all better again, so. You didn't let the insurance company total it, which is what 99% of the rest of the world would have just took the check and totaled it. Nope, I want a clean title. It's my car and it's coming back to life. And I'm very grateful that, that you said, I want to do this car. I will, oh, because you jump all over I know, oh, yeah. I know yeah. when it's done I'll, that I'll have the car back. This is a lifelong dream to have it restored. And when it's done, I would like to take it to car shows so that other people can see it. Nothing like it on the planet. And no. it'll be, I guarantee you, the most talked about 71 Cuda on the planet yeah. when we're done. So that's amazing. I say we roll this mother out and uh, let's take a good look at it. It's more important to me than anything else in the world 
Many people have said, well, will you sell it? And that car's not for sale. It wasn't for sale when I got it. It's not for sale now, and it won't be for sale in the future. You know, I just hope people can enjoy it for what it is and appreciate the graveyard. Cars is saving a piece of history. What do you think, Well, There's it's, some paint left in that car. I know, that's what I was looking at. It's the baddest car we have here. It's, it's a rare car. The fact it burned down is just absolutely insane. And it's a solid car, so it's going to be a great car to start with. Um, I'll be anxious to get this off to the dipper and see how the quality of metal is. It's, it's you know, at a million degrees. But uh, this is awesome. This is the coolest car we have, and this is like part two to the Phantom. Only just a much more rare car. Look at how I just melted the lenses out of them. It's crazy. Gosh. Originally, this car was a survivor car, and in reality today, it's still a survivor car. It just has been through a lot. 1971, 426 Hemi, automatic. 48, made. Burned every square inch. Melted, molten. All but forgotten. But like the Phoenix rising up out of the ashes, our 1971 Hemi Cuda will be back. It will be on the road. And it will be breaking hearts like it was intended to do on the day it was made. That is graveyard cars. So phenomenal job, guys. Girls, Thank you. great job. Good job, season, guys. good episodes. Uh, it was fun sharing with everybody some of the cars that we're working on at the shop but didn't get a chance, you know, to be shown in the episodes. Jermaine's 1969 Plymouth GTX, beautiful car. Mm -hmm. Seafoam turquoise. Yeah, Brian's 70 Challenger RT SC 440 automatic. The next Phantom Cuda to arrive is here. Yeah. <laughs> you guys like that, that oh, little gag I pulled there on the... Survivor. Uh, yeah. Well, technically, it is a Survivor. It is. It's just not, yeah. By definition of the automotive world, Survivor. What do you think, Will? Little touch up. Phoenix. As Joe Dirt would say, is it'll buff. It'll about? buff out. Yeah. <laughs> it is. That yeah. car is going to be the one that everybody's talking about for a long time to come because yeah. it's a very rare car. Forty-eight of them made. The guy survived. The car survived, and so to see that car Crazy. come back from the dead, literally, is where it's at right now. Will be as monumental, I believe, in the end, is our 1971 Phantom Cuda. Oh, oh hands down, car. hands down. Great bear car, baby. Now, what do you guys think of the season? Everybody have a good time? Yeah, it was awesome. A lot of fun. Yeah. What was your favorite thing that we worked on? Generally. Generally, yeah, 1969 Dodge Charger. That yeah, was fun doing that chase scene and everything. Oh. What did we deliver? God, help me. <laughs> 1970 Dodge Challenger RT 444 speed, plum crazy, white longitudinal stripe, black, oh, yeah, I mean, belong to a victim. No, not that one. Uh, 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner, 383, no, three-speed, converted over to a four-speed car. Mm -hmm. Not not that one. No. Uh, 1969 General Lee. That's up there. That was an amazing Probably, car. I guess, really probably the car. General Lee. I mean, I guess probably the General Because it was orange? Yeah. Which I had to help you with the color. You didn't help me with the Don't say the word on this show. You didn't help me with anything. You will not say that on this you show. You gave me the wrong color code, and then halfway through the job made me go babies. to the right one. Ooh, I'm thanks for the help, babies. boss. He's a bunch of babies. Anyways, I like John Buck's 71 Challenger. That was a cool car. Formal back roof. And I like John. He's just an awesome Grocery guy. getter. And he's getting a 71 Challenger with a Hellcat in it and a 69 Challenger. And I bet he'll let me drive it. I bet he will. So yes. next season, you're going to see some amazing cars, the ones we've touched on, that we're working on in the shop right now, yeah. probably along with 20 or 30 others. Thanks for watching Graveyard Cars, and we'll see you guys next season.